Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our department's 75th anniversary lecture. And we are so honoured today to have Professor Shomita Boshu with us. Um, we are in the Nanawa and Namri people's land, who are the traditional owners of the land with, on which our university's Acton campus is located. As you know, that this Nanawal and Nagambri land, it supports staff, students, and everyone, including our visitors, throughout their time at ANU. It will continue to hold a space for future generations to come together and learn from country and one another. The ANU community, and particularly our Department of International Relations, we make a commitment to always respect the land upon which we stand and ensure that the voices of these lands, indigenous peoples, are both heard and listened to, so that we move, to a, uh, move towards a future marked by cooperation and mutual respect. Today, we are going to hear from an incredible academic, a brilliant feminist scholar, and a friend of mine and many of us, uh, Professor Shomita Bushu. Professor Boshu is going to talk about women and peace and security the next 25 years. This lecture presents an assessment of the evolution of the global women, peace and security agenda with a focus on its implementation in South Asia. And it draws on lessons learned to offer potential pathways for the next 25 years. Shomita Boshu is an associate professor of international relations at the South Asian University, New Delhi. She has published on gender, international security, and the United Nations in edited volumes, as well as many important journals. IR students, you would know these journals, International Affairs, International Political Science Review, International Studies Perspective, Politics and Gender, and Security Dialogue. With Paul Kirby and Laura Shepard, Shomita Boshu co-edited New Directions in Women, Peace, and Security that was published by the Bristol University Press in 2020. In 2023, Shomita was awarded a, a very prestigious grant. It is uh, from the in Indian Council of Social Science Research for her research project titled India and the UN Security Council, Reaching Beyond the Permanent Seat. So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Boshu to deliver her lecture for us. Thanks very much, Veena, and uh, good evening, and thank you very much for being here on, I mean, I can see it's very sunny outside, so I really appreciate that you're in here, um, and that you're interested in a topic that has been the focus of my research for, I think, almost two decades now, so I'm very happy to be here to talk about it. Uh, many thanks to the Department of International Relations um, at ANU and especially Kian for inviting and hosting me and to Kian for making all the logistical arrangements. Um, my work has been informed by uh, the scholarship of uh, several researchers who have um, studied or taught at ANU, including, of course, Bina and Maria. So. Um, it's, it's a very special um, occasion and an honor for me to be part of the 75th anniversary celebrations of the founding of this department. Thank you very much. I'll start with a um, brief explanation of the title of today's lecture. Um, the first part, Women and Peace and Security, which appears to be grammatically incorrect, right? Um, so why is there an and instead of a comma between women and peace? The reference here is to the United Nations Security Council resolutions on women and peace and security. And this is the formal title of the resolution, as you can see from the screenshot. It's not women, comma, peace and security uh, coming together, but women being added to the mandate of the UN Security Council which, as you know, is maintenance of international peace and security. So the divide between women, the reference, and peace and security, the domain, is not an error, but a choice 
um, to hold steady the council's mandate. Still, the unanimous passage of Resolution 1325 in 2000, the first of these WPS resolutions, is considered to be a watershed moment because with this resolution, the UNSC recognized the gender dimensions of armed conflict and peace processes and called for policies to protect women and girls from violence during armed conflicts um, and to recognize and promote their participation in peacemaking, peacemaking, and also conflict prevention. And this was a big deal because the Security Council, which again, as you know, is the highest policy-making body in international governance of peace and security, finally said so. Now, over the last 24 years, nine subsequent resolutions have been adopted by the Security Council and numerous international, regional and national initiatives by governments and civil society organizations have developed around these resolutions. Together, this policy architecture is referred to as the WPS agenda, this time with the comma, suggesting also that the understandings and implementation of the agenda has not been bound by the relatively narrow understanding of peace and security delimited by the Council and its resolutions. The lecture today focuses on the next 25 years of the WPS agenda. Of course, we are still in the 24th year, but the momentum for the 25th anniversary has already started building up. So our discussion today is part of this larger effort to reflect on the legacy of the agenda and to forge more effective pathways forward. So in the next 30 minutes or so, and hopefully uh, not any longer, I'd like to focus on these three questions. Why and how does gender matter in international peace and security? Here I will briefly contextualize the WPS resolutions and the agenda within the more long-standing efforts to address women's marginalization and to develop gender responsive strategies in the policy discourse on international peace and security. Second, what difference has the global WPS agenda made? I will examine the evolution and implementation of the WPS agenda, specifically in the South Asian region where I live and work. And finally, what is next for the WPS agenda in the coming 25 years? I have some points here based on um, the rest of the lecture, but I hope we can have a conversation around it. And I just want to point out that the image that you see on the screen is from an arts exhibition on 1325, which was held at the Chelsea Arts Museum in 2009 in New York. And I mean, how many Security Council resolutions have had arts exhibitions on them? It just suggests the way the resolution and the agenda uh, manage the, to capture the, the attention of a, a global community. So, very quickly, why and how does gender matter in international peace and security? Now, I'll keep this discussion brief, uh, but I was hoping through this discussion for us to be on the same page. Um, in the 1990s, when the feminist scholarship on security was emerging, there was a piece by Adam Jones, incidentally in the Review of International Studies, called, Does Gender Make the World Go Round? Now, in spite of having worked on feminist security studies for some time now, I do not have a definitive answer to whether gender makes the world go round. But what I have learned from feminist scholarship and practices is that our understanding of peace and security is incomplete if we do not account for gender. Here, we can use gender as both a variable and a conceptual category. In the first case, we can ask, as Cynthia and Lo and others have done, you know, where are the women? And contrary to the dominant perception that women are missing from war fighting and peace processes, we'll find that women are not missing but made invisible. Consider these figures from UN Women. A 2020 study of informal peace efforts found that, and I quote, in three quarters of cases, so that's 27 of 38, women's groups were actively involved in grassroots level peace building, end quote. Yet, a 2023 study of women in peace processes found that, I quote again, women made up only 9.6% of negotiators, 
13.7% of mediators and 26.6% of signatories to peace and ceasefire agreements, end quote. So that's a sharp difference from the informal processes. So why this gap between presence of women in informal and formal peace processes? Well, gender bias pervades societies. Gender matters as a variable in international peace and security because, as I said, women and their perspectives are often not made visible in this domain, and so we get a partial worldview. It also matters as a conceptual category because through a gender lens, we can see how masculine values are privileged over feminine values and characteristics. In 1982, Jean Elstein wrote about the different roles attributed to men and women during wars. You would have heard about this in your uh, feminist IR classes. Uh, men are identified as the brave, just warriors who are the defenders and protectors of the community, while women are seen to be the virtuous, beautiful souls who need protecting. And as I mentioned on the slide, these characterizations give agency to the just warriors, but not the beautiful souls. In South Asia, women have been involved in both war fighting and peacemaking. The role of female combatants in LTTE in Sri Lanka and the Maoist cadres in, cadres in Nepal is very well known. There's also a long history of women's role in peace processes in, um, among other places, India and Sri Lanka. And yet, formal recognition of these efforts and inclusion of gender perspectives remain far and fa few between in the region as well. Now, I cannot capture all the complexities of the ways in which peace and security is gendered. That's not quite the focus of my discussion today. But as I said, um, and also that you know, some of you would be familiar with these debates, but I just wanted us to be on the same page before proceeding further. So moving into the policy domain, at the UN, um, advocacy on these issues uh, of kind of gender equality, gender mainstreaming, and so on, happened mostly within the institutions relating to women and gender. It was in the 1990s that the Department of Peacekeeping Operations initiated some gender mainstreaming policies. But it was really with the passage of Resolution 1325 that gender received some serious attention in the peace and security domain. And the story of, uh, about how the resolution came about is fascinating. I mean, it was certainly to me so much so that I wrote my PhD on it, and I'd be happy to um, talk about it later on. Um, but what I do want to highlight here, and this is this particular excerpt, is from before the passage of the resolution. This is from um, Women's Day in March 2000. And this is a statement made by Ambassador Anwarul uh, Chaudhary of Bangladesh, who was the president of the Security Council um, that month. And this recognition, I've highlighted that bit as well, that peace is inextricably linked with equality between women and men. I mean, if you think about it, that's quite a radical point to make at the UNSC. And this was interestingly a press statement and not a presidential statement. For a presidential statement, you need all the council member states to be on board. So the fact that this was a press statement in March shows us that the, everybody did not agree uh, about the need to talk about gender in the council. But step by step, we come to the passage of UNSCR 1325. And this was truly a landmark moment for fe uh, feminist advocacy in this arena. As you can imagine, the council and its member states did not really have the expertise, certainly in 2000, to put the resolution together. So civil society actors played a very crucial role in advocating for and in fact drafting, contributing to the drafting of the resolution. And the sense of ownership they had led Nolan Heiser of UNIFEM, uh, the predecessor to UN Women, to say that the resolution has a global constituency. Over the next 10 years, the resolution came to be associated with the four pillars mentioned on the slide, protection, prevention, participation, and relief and recovery. And at the state level, um, 110 national action plans have been adopted that, thus far. So that's more than 50% of the UN member state. 
Um, this slide has a list of uh, the subsequent WPS resolutions. Um, by 2020, the resolutions became rather contentious. The agenda became rather contentious. Um, there were, in fact, concerns that Resolution 2467 had been diluted on issues of sexual and reproductive health upon the insistence of the United States, and this was during the Trump presidency. Uh, interestingly, around the same time, uh, well, just, yeah, around the same time, Indonesia presided over the passage of Resolution 2538 on female personnel in UN peacekeeping operations. Um, and it, it's interesting, um, well, certainly to me, that um, this resolution was adopted as a peacekeeping resolution and not a WPS res resolution. Um, I would think this is partly because of the contentious nature of the agenda, but to me, it's a positive sign of gender mainstreaming, that you didn't have to call a, a, a resolution focusing on uh, women peacekeepers a, a WPS resolution. This, uh, below the list of uh, resolutions, I've noted some of their highlights. Um, and actually, regarding the first point about the um, the, uh, the special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. You see, if you recall the announcement for today's lecture, the picture is that of Ms. Pramela Patton of Mauritius, who has been serving in this role since um, as the special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict since 2017. Okay. Let's now move towards the assessment of the WPS agenda. This slide captures some of the, the initial debates which have carried on as well. So on the one hand, the resolution brought unprecedented attention to gender dimensions of armed conflicts. Uh, Gender-related offices were created, for instance, in uh, peacekeeping missions, and there was some resource allocation as well. Um, and Resolution 1325 uh, was part of a, a series of Security Council resolutions on themes such as protection of civilians in armed conflict, HIV AIDS and international peacekeeping operations, and children and armed conflicts, which were adopted in the period 1999 to 2000. And Edward Luck has suggested that these resolutions were adopted to serve as a normative compass for the Security Council as it contended with new types um, of armed conflicts in the 21st century with a lot of um, significant humanitarian consequences as well. Conversely, of course, critics have noted that the initial re resolutions especially did not take account of multiple factors such as race, class, age, ethnicity, etc., that also shape women's experiences of armed conflicts. The understanding of peace and security was also narrow, and so, for instance, the resolutions did not initially take account of social and economic rights of women, even though, as you can imagine, inheritance rights for example, was, uh, were a major issue uh, in post-conflict societies. There was also a concern that this was all talk, and states and organizations that claimed to advance the WPS agenda actually did not put the necessary resources, so this was a kind of cost-free resolution. Finally, of course, the case of Afghanistan, uh, which I hope we'll have a chance to discuss in some more detail later on, um, that was used to suggest that the resolutions essentially served to gender wash interventionist policies of the council and powerful member states. That said, um, it is pretty impressive, as I said, that um, 110 countries have at some point or another adopted national action plans. This figure, which is from the Peace Women uh, website of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, um, it, it doesn't tell us in this figure how many of these national action plans have actually expired, or for that matter, how many of these uh, did not actually have a budget allocation. So again, the implementation remained a problem. Um, I should also just add very quickly that 
I really like this figure, so I put it up there, but it says 109 national action plans. This year, Zimbabwe uh, adopted its national action plan in, I think, May or June this, this year. Um, on NAPS uh, and the, the national action plans and other aspects of the WPS agenda, there are, of course, certain global trends, um, some of which I indicated earlier in the discussion on promises and pitfalls. Um, but to get a more in-depth understanding of implementation, I will focus now on um, South Asian engagement with the WPS agenda. So I first learned about Resolution 1325 um, a couple of years prior to beginning my doctoral research, while I was working at um, this organization called Women in Security, Conflict Management, and Peace, um, which is based in Delhi. Um, but it was set up in 1999 to, I quote from its website, build a culture of coexistence and nonviolence in South Asia that is gender sensitive and inclusive, end quote. So it had a very kind of regional focus. And I had, a, therefore, a, uh, a first-hand um, experience of feminist peace work in the region before I learned about 1325. And even though my own research has focused now for um, many, many years on the WPS agenda, my starting point when examining gender, peace, and security is not what the Security Council has to say um, since 2000, but what peace groups in the region have done over the last several decades. Still, um, in 2011, um, when I returned to India after uh, a few years of doctoral work and postdoctoral research, I was surprised to find a relative lack of interest uh, among much I'm most civil society actors regarding the WPS agenda. My own world revolved around WPS, so when I come back and see that the, the, the feminist uh, peace advocates that I knew were barely talking about uh, WPS, um, this, I, I was surprised. Of course, the government's muted response was understandable. Um, the Indian government's position is that there are no conflicts within the country, and therefore the Security Council resolutions do not apply. Uh, so India's WPS work has focused uh, mostly on uh, UN peacekeeping, uh, and in fact it sent the, all, the first all-female form police unit to Liberia in 2007 and has continued to be sort of outward-oriented in its WPS engagement. So for me, the puzzle actually, as I said, lay in the relative lack of interest among civil society actors in India. It was not that they, uh, certainly the Delhi-based practitioners, did not know about the resolutions. In fact, some of them were very active in transnational advocacy networks that had pushed for the adoption of something like the Security Council resolution. However, they chose not to engage with it because of their skepticism um, about the Council. And as far as international policies go, they much preferred instruments such as CEDAW or the Beijing Platform for Action, uh, which they found to be more holistic and meaningful. In the same year, moving to a different country now, in 2011, Nepal adopted its first national action plan. Um, it was only the second one in Asia after Philippines to do so. A few years later, Afghanistan adopted its national action plan in 2015. What stood out for me, however, is that for the longest time, the only two countries in South Asia to have a national action plan were ones that had hosted UN political missions. So the role of the international was quite important here. Bangladesh adopted its national action plan in 2019 and Sri Lanka in 2023. Um, in collaboration with UN Women and with support of governments of Norway and Japan, respectively. So again, here also we see the role of the international, but um, except, I mean, there were civil society consultations in all these cases. The Nepal one is the best example. The Afghanistan one, um, some of the Afghan 
uh, gender advocates have, so Vazma Frog, for instance, has, has written that it wasn't consultative enough because for security reasons, they could not go outside of certain uh, territory. And so in that sense, it was considered to be more uh, top down. Uh, so, but the other resolutions, uh, the other national action plans, um, there, there was a lot of civil society consultation. I'll now answer the um, second question on um, what difference has the global WPS agenda made, specifically um, in South Asia, drawing on a chapter um, I wrote recently on what the international has meant for peace work in feminist peace work in South Asia, with the WPS agenda serving as a stand-in for the international. Before I do so, however, a quick explanation of the images you see on the screen. There's a photo of Afghan refugee <clears throat> women and their children in Pakistan. And uh, this is from before the Taliban takeover in 2021. Then the Naga Mothers Association, whose um, peace work in the northeast of India has been exemplary. And finally, a photo of female LTT soldiers, just to show the diversity of women's involvement in this domain. Um, I should add also that the choice of sites where the different women are is more to do with good photos I could find online rather than association of a country with any particular gender aspect of the conflict. So therefore I included this picture <clears throat> when much of the international community, well after much of the international community left Afghanistan uh, post August 2021, we saw women and girls protesting against the Taliban regime's diktats against girls' education, employment, etc. Um, and they did so um, in, uh, in spite of a lot of repression um, that, that followed. Okay, so what difference has the global WPS agenda made in South Asia? As in many other parts of the world, uh, feminist peace builders familiar with 1325 looked into the scope for using the resolution for their ongoing work because they've been doing this kind of work already for, um, for a while. Uh, Vishaka Dharmadasa of Sri Lanka, for instance, says that the WPS agenda extended women's peace activism and political participation in Sri Lanka. And while there's a lot of um, solidarity among women peace builders in the region, um, as Minakshi Gopinath has noted, the WPS agenda did provide a shared vocabulary to feminist activists on the ground. There's a general recognition that WPS as part of the larger international policy architecture on gender issues that includes UDHR, CEDAW, um, the Beijing Platform for Action, could potentially serve as a resource for feminist peace builders in the region. The WPS agenda has had some success um, also in terms of drawing attention to local issues. For instance, Nepal's first national action plan recognized multiple categories of conflict affected women, including widows who were not mentioned in the early set of WPS resolutions, um, the Bangladesh NAP makes references to protection of women, not only in conflict situations, but also natural disasters and humanitarian crisis. So that's kind of outside of what the Security Council initially uh, started with. Well, at the same time, uh, those critical of the WPS agenda have drawn attention to the ways in which it reproduces global uh, power hierarchies. Um, so for instance, uh, based on her analysis of an economic empowerment program in Sri Lanka that was to implement the WPS agenda, and this was before um, its adoption of National Action Plan, Vasuki Nasaya notes, um, I quote, resolution 1325 implementation could be invoked to legitimate globally hegemonic economic choices by focusing on the inclusion of women as economic actors rather than the specific economic policies that will shape the script within which they act. I know it's a bit of a wordy sentence, but it really speaks to me because it's saying that we are adding women to uh, 
structures that have already been given and, and not quite localized either. And furthermore, the political economy of the WPS agenda is extremely important because um, over the last couple of decades, a lot of project funding has come into the region as it has in other parts of the global south as well uh, in the framework of women, peace and security. Civil society actors have relied on support from international donor organizations for their work. And we know what that sometimes, well, often means, the sort of prioritization of a donor-led agenda. And this has not only reproduced global hierarchies, but also created and exacerbated differences within actors in the region that compete to secure these funds. But I mean, I know there's a lot of yes, but, yes, but, but I think that is how the agenda has actually played out. So the um, attention and resources that the resolutions bring to feminist peace efforts cannot be disregarded. Uh, Rita Manchanda uh, from, um, from India, who was in fact uh, part of the momentum which led to the uh, adoption of 1325, is generally critical of the WPS agenda. I don't think she'd mind my saying so. But she nevertheless points out, and I quote, global WPS norms and policy thrust of gender equality have produced gains evident in the dramatic visibility of the numbers of women in institutional power structures, especially in the internationalized processes of Afghanistan and Nepal, end quote. So the agenda then has both supported and harmed, as she goes on to note, uh, the peace work being done in the region. Now, speaking of harms, Afghanistan is a case in point. The WPS agenda was used in the service of the war on terror. Laura Bush famously said that the fight against terrorism is also a fight for the rights and dignity of women. And later, during the US Taliban negotiations that led to the signing of the Doha Accords, as uh, this is from, uh, as Anne-Marie Gates writes, um, it's from a book chapter, the US negotiator Zalmeh Khalilizad signaled that gender equality issues were to be treated as a domestic matter. So suddenly, now it was a domestic issue uh, that the international community, or certainly the US, did not need to deal with. So for feminists who've been working on peace for a long time and used to such ebbs and flows, 1325 is one more tool in their toolbox. Those who see value in adopting the vocabulary of the WPS agenda have done so for strategic reasons, to secure attention, resources, and where possible, accountability from formal institutions. But ultimately, as Hina Jilani of Pakistan notes, it is our own initiatives and movement building in the region that gives us our energy and provides more solace than the UN. Let us build on 1325. Whatever you have on hand, you use to your advantage, but it cannot be the center of our focus. And that's the value of 1325 I see in the region as well. Now, coming to the final part um, of the lecture today, what is next for the WPS agenda in the coming 25 years? As I said, I have some initial thoughts, and I hope we can build on it uh, together during the, the discussion. Um, but before going to the 25th anniversary, I thought I'd uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the earlier anniversaries, because Every big anniversary, um, I'm sure in your personal lives as well, is a moment of reckoning. Um, now, if I recall correctly, um, it does feel a bit like once upon a time, the mood was upbeat on the 10th anniversary in 2010. This, um, this was the time when more and more actors were getting invested in the WPS agenda. The 2008 financial crisis notwithstanding, there were funds to do WPS work, but this is also the time when there was an increasing professionalization of the agenda and a generational change of sorts. For the professionals newly arrived on the scene, the WPS agenda was the starting point and shaped their worldview. Those who had been in the field for longer 
contextualize the resolutions within the larger ambit of their piecework. And I saw this, um, this tension between the two approaches play out in relation to the prevention pillar. I recall being at a workshop uh, which was part of the 10th anniversary summit held at the University of San Diego. San Diego and um, I found some civil society um, representatives talking about prevention as prevention of violence against women and girls. And you'll find that in some of the policy literature as well. And I had just finished my PhD a year ago, and I was like, I am sure that it refers to conflict prevention. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, I, I cannot be that wrong. Um, so fortunately, right after that, there was I went to New York for a peace fair that was um, uh, held, uh, that was organized again as part of the 10th anniversary celebrations in October 2010. Um, and reconnected with feminist peace advocates like Betty Reardon, Cora Weiss, um, who had been involved in the drafting of the resolution and uh, who very kindly confirmed that prevention did, in fact, refer to conflict prevention. But as I said, you will find that, I mean, I was in preparation for today's lecture, I was reading some of these reflections that I've already being published on the 25th anniversary. Um, and some of these refer to prevention um, as prevention of violence against women. And so protection is referred to protection of rights. So for me, this has remained that 2010 experience and slight existential crisis has remained an example of how technical language is pliable and can be used to serve certain goals. In this case, the marginalization of the conflict prevention component of the WPS agenda. Um, coming to the 15th anniversary, um, uh, that had its share of publications and adoption, adoption of national action plans. Um, the highlight, I would say, was the release of the global study on the implementation of UNSCR 1325, which, um, uh, for which Radhika Kumaraswamy is uh, the lead author. For those interested in WPS, and if you haven't read it yet, I would strongly recommend it. Um, it's, the paper copy is really heavy, but also with reason, it is, it's just full of really great information and analysis. I was based on extensive consultations across the world and sought to present a lot of evidence on why women, peace, and security mattered. Now, um, the mood at the 20th uh, anniversary was somewhat somber, not just because of the pandemic, this was 2020, but because by this time we were seeing this global backlash against women's rights and what's been called gender ideology. Um, Russia, which has generally been hostile to discussions on gender in the Security Council, proposed a draft WPS resolution, which commentators um, argued was aimed to weaken the normative framework of the WPS agenda. It did not go through. Um, more generally, there was a sense that, and I think I, I have thought so for some time now that we don't need any more resolutions. The focus really had to be on an implementation because the implementation happens at the national and local levels. In some ways, even 1325 was enough. You could use it for the purposes that international policies can be used. Um, Commenting on what was happening around this, this time, the NGO Working Group um, on Women, Peace, and Security wrote, um, instead of a full-bodied celebration of the first 20 years of the WPS agenda, women's rights advocates have been forced to defend the progress they have made. And this need to hold the fort, uh, pardon my use of a sort of militarized term, but it remains crucial today. The civil society actors who contributed to the passage of Resolution 1325 uh, saw that resolution, the first one, as a step towards conflict prevention. Uh, however, as I pointed out, um, that's been marginalized over the last uh, couple of decades. There's, how, there's been a disproportionate focus, in fact, on the protection pillar, 
which led one of the early advocates to say, Cora Weiss, who I mentioned earlier as well, that the resolutions were not aimed to make war safe for women, and she was cited very often. Um, not that the not that protection is not important, and indeed it is connected to the other pillars, participation, prevention, and relief and recovery, but there was a sense that not enough was being done to advance the other pillars because it is easier to talk about women and girls as victims uh, rather than as agents. Uh, what the observations in South Asia and indeed elsewhere demonstrate is not just the links between the different pillars, but also that WPS has to be understood and implemented vis-a-vis -vis local and regional concerns relating to development, environment, disasters, etc. cetera. Um, and this has been a, a lesson for me personally, because when I started working on women, peace and security, even though I have a very broad understanding of security, I still focused on armed conflicts primarily. And to see the kind of um, civil society work and national action plans that have emerged in Asia, in Africa, um, I really appreciate the connections that the advocates there have made between the local concerns. Because you cannot speak about women, peace and security in a narrow framework if it has to be really meaningful in the local context. So that certainly is something that, that I've learned. Um, and also that in terms of policy responses, um, the WPS agenda, the resolutions, etc., need to be contextualized within wider policy architectures on gender equality and sustainable peace. And that's how the agenda can actually speak to the lived realities of the conflict affected and, as I said, become more meaningful. As far as inclusion of women and gender perspectives is concerned, there's been a lot of focus on instrumental arguments. So what we hear is, for example, we should have more women in formal peace processes because it makes the agreement more sustainable. Or we need more female peacekeepers because evidence shows that this reduces sexual exploitation and abuse by male peacekeepers. And I understand the need to make these arguments because these are more effective in hostile circumstances. Susanna Mandalini, for instance, has written about it in her 2007 book that if, if you know, those, I guess that if those who are not on the same page as you, those who are hostile, then you give these instrumental um, reasons. But my hope is that we can move towards the rights-based agreements, that underrepresented groups, including women and diverse groups of women, should have a say in processes that affect their lives. And also, there is a need to recognize the work that they already do in informal spaces. Unfortunately, um, this looks difficult as gender advocates, including in the peace and security domain, have to contend with global backlash against women's rights and, um, and all kinds of uh, progressive work that has happened um, in, in the last several decades. And these challenges are exacerbated by the fact that resources to address WPS issues are limited. And in fact, the 2015 global study that I referred to earlier identified insufficient resource allocation as the most serious and persistent obstacle to the implementation of the WPS agenda. So um, in terms of numbers, they note, for instance, that only 2% of aid to peace and security interventions in fragile states and economies in 2012, 2013 targeted gender equality as a principal objective. That's a very, very low number. Um, and I know the this is dated because this is 2012, 2013 that I'm referring to. I tried looking for updated um, data, but I fear in this particular case, the numbers actually would not have changed very much. Finally, um, I just want to um, end this discussion by looking at the actors who are involved in uh, taking the agenda forward or backward, because that would be important, that agency would be important for the next 25 years. So international organizations, uh, especially intergovernmental organizations, and also 
big civil society organizations have, of course, been key to advancing the WPS agenda. But as we know, they're all struggling. There are more and more crises and emergency situations. And usually when it comes to gender issues, it's like, OK, we'll deal with the priority stuff and then get to gender. Um, and with the kind of challenges that we're seeing in multilateralism, um, that's, that's a worry about, uh, about the kind of work that international organizations would be able to do vis-a-vis um, -vis the, uh, the agenda. Um, as far as states are concerned, uh, there's a lot of discourse on feminist foreign policy um, today. And of course, it is related to the women, peace, and security agenda as well. Um, but at the same time, again, this is a phrase that really caught my um, imagination and attention. This is from Anne-Marie Gates um, uh, in, in 2016, where she um, said the world is renationalizing. And she used the term renationalizing to refer to closing of borders, turning away from multilateral forums, processes that she notes are sharply gendered. So the world is, I would agree with her, has continued to renationalize in, uh, in very extreme ways. And while it is encouraging that some countries are uh, adopting feminist foreign policies, I'm afraid the Swedish example tells us that we are beholden to good old national interest. Um, and so when I compare, I do find that, I, I do find myself having more faith in the WPS agenda, which we can tear apart, but also build together. Um, but, uh, and, and it's more dynamic, where, whereas with feminist foreign policy, I think um, the state's interests are, of course, paramount. That's, that's just the nature of foreign policy. And the final point, and that's, that's what I want to end with, um, um, is, is the role of civil society actors. Um, and here I have uh, mentioned this point about positional differences on 1325. Uh, just backing um, again to 2000, <clears throat> um, the three uh, feminist practitioners from um, South Asia who wrote the chapter from which I've drawn this bit, they said that, um, um, that when the momentum for a resolution was building in 1999, 2000, they were all there. But they at least two of them wanted a general assembly resolution because uh, they thought that a general res assembly resolution would be more open, again, more holistic. It would hold all states to account and not only conflict affected states. I disagree with them because I think there is a value to a Security Council resolution. We don't just, because in 2000, the General Assembly also had a resolution, but I don't think any of us really know about it. So in that sense, for all its problems, we pay attention when the Security Council says something. But what I'm trying to get at, or what they were, um, what I want to highlight from their position is that they have been very active uh, feminist peace practitioners, part of very much part of the transnational networks, but they differed with what their colleagues from different parts of the world said. Even in India, a, a context that I'm more familiar with within South Asia, there's a lot of difference be within civil society actors on how the WPS agenda should be taken forward. And I think the, um, th 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 this is, um, in some ways, we uh, in the next 25 years, we should be open to these diverse perspectives and see how uh, these can be brought together to take the agenda forward rather than to rely primarily on those who are better funded and have more forums to, to speak on. Um, so um, when we speak of, for instance, I haven't talked very much about it, but decolonizing the WPS agenda, even within the global south, even within the context of South, a south Asia, there's a need to make sure that the agenda is open to diverse, sometimes opposing viewpoints on how to achieve gender equality, because that is what will um, 
push us forward in the next 25 years. And the final thing I want to say after having spent so much time talking about the WPS agenda and being a WPS advocate is that feminists who do peace work, they do so with or without WPS. And ultimately, that's what matters. Thanks very much for your patience.